Hi, I'm Dr. Anne Sylvestre with Focus and Flourish. I see more and more commentaries on ovariectomy versus ovariohysterectomy. When I look through our professional sites on the internet or even in our journals, let's have a look at it. So clearly we're doing an ovariohysterectomy, removing everything, including the uterus, because that's what we're taught. That has been the norm, the gold standard for years. Is that really the correct way to do it? Well, the thinking was if you take out the ovaries, then there's no reason to have a uterus. Essentially, the body now has to support an organ that is no longer necessary. Could there be a problem in the future which would require for us to go and remove that leftover uterus? Yes, it could happen. So, well, why not just take it now? That's been the thinking. However, the ovariectomy, which is just removing the ovaries from a surgical point of view, is a much simpler procedure. It is a shorter surgery, requires a smaller incision that could be better positioned over the ovaries so that right ovary isn't necessarily as difficult to remove as sometimes it is. There are definite advantages to just removing the ovaries. But are there disadvantages? Is it a problem to leave the uterus behind once the ovaries have been removed? So that being the logic, are there any studies to support that? There are a couple of studies. Trust me, there are many commentaries in the literature, but actual studies where they look to see if there are issues more or less with one procedure over the other are lacking in our journals. There's one paper from the 1990s that looked at ovariectomy versus ovariohysterectomy, and they got information from the pet owners as to whether their dogs had further issues with the left over uterus once that pet was geriatric. And they found that there really weren't any issues down the road, but they had a very small number of patients in this particular study and really not enough that you could come up to a conclusion that is valid. And then there was a 2005 or 2006 maybe study where they looked at what was already in the literature and they found no significant difference between the two categories when you're looking down the road did anybody develop some issues uh, again not uh, they had a lot more patients in there but not uh, a great paper from the point of making conclusions that apply to our general population because they looked at what was in the literature and what's in the literature are what usually people in academia are writing so it's really not what the general practitioners are seeing that paper may not be particularly uh, representative of what's happening in the population having said all that you do have to trust your knowledge that if the ovaries are out really there shouldn't be without the hormonal influence the uterus should be okay and the ovariectomy should be okay and of course i have an opinion on this which i'm going to share with you after graduating from vet school i spent two years in general practice in new brunswick canada there was another general practice in our area and the veterinarian there this was a long time ago all right so let's let's just be clear on that right but the veterinarian there was known to do what we would have called an incomplete spay in my two years i saw three patients two cats one dog present to me in their geriatric years because they had an issue with this left inside the body uterus. The two cats both had pyometras. The dog had um, what I would have called a mucometra or hydrometra. It was sterile, but the uterus was just distended with this clear 
gel kind of material within it. And of course the dog was quite uncomfortable with it. Now, none of these patients had a history of ovarian remnant syndrome. I knew enough even way back then to ask about that and nor did I find remnants of ovaries in any of those patients. But remember, these were my first two years out in practice. Could I have missed ovarian remnants? Yeah, absolutely I could have missed those. Could I have missed a comorbidity causing these pets to develop issues with their uterus? Yes, I could have. But keep in mind, if they hadn't had a lot of uterine tissue left inside the body, they would not have needed another surgery during their geriatric years. So it's just something to consider. Do I think that my three cases should change how the world sees ovariectomy versus ovariohysterectomy? No, they're anecdotal. But three cases in two years is an awful lot. So I think we should just pay attention and I think we should look more closely into this and not be afraid to report. Let people know if you do see a case so we can have a better understanding of what it is that we're doing. I would love to see the ovariectomy become the norm because it is a faster, easier surgery. But if you're a new grad, I really think you should get comfortable with the ovariohysterectomy before you drop down to just doing the ovariectomy. Why? Because the ovariohysterectomy is going to teach you so much more about working in the abdomen, about the anatomy of the reproductive area, and it will prepare you for when you do get that emergency case and it's a PIO and you need to deal with it. You want to be comfortable with that surgery before you have to do it in an emergency situation. Once again, that's just my opinion and my two cents worth. And I would love to hear your comments on that. And what are you doing out there? Are you doing an ovariectomy or are you doing an ovariohysterectomy? I think both are great. Whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. And let's keep on helping the dogs and cats that are out there in our communities. I hope you found this video helpful. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.